In the name of God, creator, redeemer, strengthening guide. Amen. Please, please be seated. The calendars, not to mention the weather, have brought us to a shift in the seasons. It's as a switch has been flipped up or flipped down. Thanksgiving Day is behind us. Many have returned from friends or families' homes after the holiday meal. Some may be returning today. Black Friday has come and leads into Small Business Saturday, something I just learned about the other day. And both send us into Cyber Monday and Giving Tuesday with their frequent online appeals. Driving to Brunswick on Friday uh, so that my sister-in-law could catch the Down Easter train back to Boston, we passed numerous displays on the Route 1 and elsewhere of uh, people selling Christmas wreaths and Christmas trees. And we stopped for a sandwich in a pub in Brunswick before the train left and we're inundated with Christmas music as we watched a staff person putting up a Christmas tree. Still digesting Thanksgiving in all its senses of the word, it seemed a sudden shift that we were not particularly ready for. And this is no reflection on St. Francis' own Christmas wreath offerings <laughs> or on the giving tree that is outside in the narthex, and you should pay close attention to both. And for those who purchased a Christmas wreath, I believe they can be picked up after church today. So we are launched into a new season, and, and here on the church calendar, we've come to the end of the long season of Pentecost, or rather more technically, the season after Pentecost. You may remember that the day of Pentecost was back on May 28th, quite a long time ago, it seems. And looking back at my calendar, I realized that Donna Downs and I joined you here at St. Francis on the following Sunday on June 4th, which was Trinity Sunday, and you may remember on that day the Reverend Suzanne Roberts from the diocese was here to celebrate and speak after the service about the search process for your new rector, uh, and, um, uh, and, and we, Donna and I, were introduced as your interim rectors, co-interim rectors, and um, you know, it seems that such a while ago, and now, now that I'm finally learning everybody's names, you know, um, I'm so delighted that you have a new rector coming in January, but both Donna and I are looking forward to being here with you through the season of Advent and on Christmas as well. So there is change in the air and change can be both exciting and, as you know, a little unsettling, too. And as we look forward with excitement and hope of what is to come, and also acknowledge whatever anxiety and perhaps dread that creeps in and swirls around, our lectionary this morning gives us two salient points to consider. First, Ezekiel writes, Thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. Ezekiel is writing during the Babylonian exile and the hope of the people being returned to their promised land of Judah and Israel. Interesting, this might take on new meaning, given what is going on in Gaza and Israel right now, perhaps even for us closer to the home in the aftermath of the Lewiston shootings. And that is all for another sermon on another day. But we can say that even in the midst of great turmoil and darkness, God's grace finds us and comfort pours in. Second, we, uh, using again the imagery of sheep and the pasture, the psalmist writes, we are the people of God's pasture and the sheep of God's hand. 
God has called us and all to be part of this time and place, this season, to use our gifts and talents to bring God's kingdom to fruition. Or if not fully to fruition, at least to help break it in. As you know, uh, both the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament draw on pastoral, the pastoral imagery of sheep and shepherds in considering the leaders and people of God. It's King David, after all, is the great uh, shepherd king, and Ezekiel speaks of someone to come who will be in that spirit of King David, who will be of King David's lineage, and we know that that comes in Jesus himself. As Christians, we recognize Jesus as the good shepherd, a benevolent king among kings, standing for us and standing with us in the battles we face, in the divisiveness that threatens to break us, and with a deep love that is there to restore us. So there is great comfort and hope in the sense that we are looked for when we feel lost, cared for when things seem disoriented. The Good Shepherd cares for us, and hearing that voice, we are to care for each other in return. We are to carry that responsibility forward to others. With such glory at work in us, we can then do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Now, for the third week in a row, we have heard a story from the Gospel of Matthew with Jesus speaking about the coming of God's kingdom, that realm breaking in, but also with that, with that touch of judgment. Two weeks ago, or I should say three weeks ago, we heard the story about the bridesmaids and their oil lamps. And the message was to make sure that oil was at hand, that the lamps were ready to be lit. It didn't mean that they had to be lit all the time, but that they were just ready to go. And last week, we heard the story about the king who left his servants in charge of his talents, a great sum of money, each given a sum according to his own ability. And we heard how a few of them, two of them actually invested wisely and another just buried it. And the king wasn't pleased with that because that last one didn't take any risk in reaching out to serve others. One of the underscoring messages uh, of these lessons was how best to put our faith and our moral and ethical grounding to work. And then that bit of judgment, lest we be thrown out into the void with weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I can't remember how many times in Matthew, Matthew uses that expression, that weeping and gnashing of teeth. But we'd like to avoid that, I can assure you. <laughs> Today, we hear of the Son of Man coming in his glory and all the angels with him. Sitting on his throne, he will separate the sheep from the goats, putting those favored on his right, and those not on his left. And just a moment of digression, you know, goats were just as important to the shepherds and the goat herders then as they are now. So it's not a comment just on goats are less than sheep are, but the sheep and the goats here together, and he needed something to make a point. So here are the, the goats over here. His judgment will be based on those who have cared for one another and those who have not. Just as you did to the least of these, so you did to me. Now, my guess is we've all fallen short at some time in this. And this reminds me of two brief stories that I'll share with you right now. First, and this was quite a number of years ago, um, well before I was ordained, I took the EFM program, Education for Ministry. 
And my teacher in that, the mentor as uh, they are called, and she was called, once shared with us a story. And she, she began by saying, um, my sister-in-law and I have never gotten along. As a matter of fact, we really can't stand each other. <laughs> and we can walk into a room where the other is there, and immediately the tension goes up. And we know that World War III is about to break out. Well, this concerned my teacher enough that, as she told us, she went and talked to her priest about this and uh, kind of explain this, that this greatly troubles me because I am supposed to care and love for everyone and I'm really having a hard time here. And he responded by saying, well, if you were in the desert and you saw your sister-in-law coming towards you, parched and dehydrated and asking you for a glass of water, would you give her a glass of water? And she said, well, yes, of course I would. And he said, you're fine. <laughs> All is good. That is what you need to do. You need to respond to her need, and that is the deepest need right there. And then many, again, many years ago, I attended a clergy conference, uh, and our keynote speaker was the late Reverend Peter Gomes. And Peter Gromes, as you may know, was the plumber professor of Christian morals at Harvard and was the minister of Harvard's Memorial Chapel and was a noted preacher, professor, and pastor. And speaking on this passage that we heard from the gospel today, the Reverend Gomes spoke about his concern of Christ appearing in the guise of another person. This might be the confused or angry member of his congregation whom he longs to get away from, he said, or a student of his who is just not getting it at all. Could be anyone, he said. And he seemed to be speaking for all of us. And his point was that he saw his own inadequacies surface, and knowing this, he would just simply try a little harder. He acknowledged, you know, those feelings wouldn't go away, but he'd be aware of it and know that Christ was coming to him at any moment. This is the last Sunday of this current church year. And the subtitle for this Sunday is Christ the King. And here we affirm and celebrate the source of authority in our spiritual lives and perhaps our secular lives as well, Jesus Christ. The Reverend Herbert O'Driscoll writes, For a Christian, Christ's example is the ultimate pattern for living, the ultimate pattern for living, his teaching the ultimate source of wisdom, his moral demands the ultimate standards of thought and conduct. What we do, we do what we can to live in and by and through him. We do what we can to encourage one another to gear together here at St. Francis and out beyond these walls, whether with fellow Christians or not. And some days we are right on and some days, well, we need to work a bit harder to get there. Jesus points out that the kingdom opens for those who welcome a stranger, for those who clothe the naked, care for the sick, give water to those who thirst, who visit someone who feels trapped or in prison or is sick. The kingdom is open to those who care for and respond to human need. Herbert O'Driscoll suggests, the reign of Christ is a triumph of caring. So, scripture, our gospel this morning, tells us that there is a kingdom to come, to break in around it, and to find it, we are to focus less on self and more on the other. And part of the good news of the gospel is that we are here again this morning to hear this, 
to remind ourselves of this. That day hasn't come yet, that day of judgment, at least in its fullness. And so we have time. We can fill our oil lamps. We can take the talents we have and maybe invest them a bit more. Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. And God says, let me hold you, let me comfort you, let me feed you, so you may do that to others. For just as you do to the least of those in my kingdom, so you do to me. In Christ's name, amen.